Well, I started out as an equity research analyst uh, on Wall Street. And I worked 20 years at an investment bank doing that, studying companies in the transportation logistics space, um, best practices through multiple cycles. And yeah, at some point I got to where I learned a ton and built a great network um, and wanted to see what was next in the evolution and, and apply all of those learnings. And, and uh, you know, the opportunity came about you know, to join a couple companies uh, on the strategy side you know, that were you know, in need of some, some help to, to, to grow or to turn around and, and go in a better place. And so it's been, uh, it's been I guess, helpful and, and useful to take you know, what I know works or what I've seen work uh, and apply this in company-specific situations uh, to get the companies to a better place. So I first started collecting art around 2010, 2011, um, and it was around the time when you know I had my own home and uh, you know it'd been you know, somewhat established in my career. And you know, some people want to spend money on bigger TVs or, or nicer cars. Um, I've always really liked beautiful things, and you know, specifically artwork. And, and so the first piece I ever bought was at a gallery in La Jolla, California. Uh, my girlfriend at the time and I were on vacation, walking by, I saw this amazing abstract piece, very large scale, colorful, uh, and just decided that I wanted it. Uh, and that was the first nice piece of art I ever, I ever bought. Um, and then that kind of started a, a snowball uh, that has, has grown significantly over the years and has been a ton of fun along the way. And it, it helped as well that I had a mentor in Baltimore, uh, this guy Walt Pearson, who started me on you know, the art collecting journey. It gave me a little bit even more of a push uh, because he found out that I was interested in art and he had been collecting for a number of years and he had a mentor to him who got him started in collecting and so he brought me over to his house and they were looking to move and downsize and uh, you know cut me a very good deal you know what I found out in retrospect from you know a few pieces that I purchased from him uh, to, to really boost the collection and then you know as I traveled around the world for work going you know, to galleries in London or Sydney or New York, wherever I was, um, you know, I was able to see a lot of different art and, and often um, you know, when I connected with a piece, buy the work and sometimes even meet the artist. Well, Miami Art Scene is fantastic. Where most people start is Art Basel. And Art Basel happens every year. It's been going on for something like 23 years down here uh, in Miami. It's the biggest art fair in North America. And it's not just our Basel, our Basel is what they call the main fair. It's one of a couple dozen fairs that are going on that week. And it's just an insane amount of artwork everywhere. Um, incredible exposure to art artists from around the world. Uh, and so that initially put Miami on the map as a place to go see art. On the creative side, uh, which has been most exciting here in Miami the last five to 10 years is the emerging art community and artist scene in terms of artists living here and, and uh, creating in Miami rather than you know, traditional New York or LA. Uh, and in the US specifically, New York's always been number one for you know, art and artists. It's, it's just the biggest market. Uh, LA is it, it kind of cemented itself as the number two uh, art scene in the US. Uh, and there really was no number three uh, after that. It was a steep drop off for, for a long, long time. But I think the foundation of Art Basel coming here and then the you know, emerging uh, scene of artists and community of artists in Miami. I think Miami's now firmly planted itself as number three, uh, you know, in the U.S. You know, uh, in terms of art community and, and artists. Uh, so it's been a great time to be in Miami. I think it's only going to continue to grow uh, down here from there. So this has been a ton of fun to do. Um, it's been a great experience. Uh, the show closes at the end of this weekend. It's been up for about a month. Uh, very positive feedback. Lucky to have a lot of friends that have come out and supported. And very successful opening night uh, you know, with, with, with that uh, debut. And you know, it's been a process that's, you could say it started years ago. Um, you know, I've officially been painting in a studio here in Miami for about five years. And one of my friends who's a professional artist here in Miami, David Benegas, he's the one that got me into painting. So I started as a, as a collector. You, know, you can go back further and say I actually started as an artist, became a collector, and came back to an artist, because you know, 
was uh, a kid, I took an art class and I used to draw people and animals in pastel and charcoal, and that was my training and background. Um, and then as I started buying art, I, I went more into abstract uh, and, and the painting side of things. And through the, the process of collecting, I met a lot of great artists. And, and David is one of the ones that, you know, I spent time with here in Miami and would go over to the studio. And he invited me a couple times to come paint with him. And then, you know, I resisted at first or, or, or just kind of didn't take him up on it for one reason or another. And then ultimately decided, yeah, let's go do it and, and have some fun. And so I went over to the studio. He had a blank canvas hanging on the wall for me. He had his own piece that he was working on, you know, across the way with his paint and brushes and tools. And he gave me a whole stack of paints and brushes and tools as well. He said, go at it. You know, and really that was about it. He, he left to do his own thing. I started painting, um, you know, did my thing, had music playing. A few hours later, I had my first painting. And, and it was a ton of fun, so much so that I ended up getting my own space. And uh, the space I got is over at this uh, community called Art Hood 56. And, you know, it's about a dozen artists that are in there that have their own different studios. And there's a gallery in the middle where we, we each display a couple of pieces. And so through that, I began painting and experimenting and, um, you know, really figuring out who I was as an artist. Now, for me, you know, the whole COVID period was great because I had a studio and most people were stuck at home or, uh, you know, on Instagram or freaking out about the news or whatever it was. I was painting um, and got a ton of work done and a ton of growth uh, that year and, and came out of it and continued to evolve. And so a friend of mine, uh, you know, here in Miami, well, through friends, um, you know, I met a gallerist who had actually represented a couple of friends of mine, other artists that had, you know, shown with her. And she offered me a, a solo show here at Club Gallery in Miami. And I said, let's do it. And, uh, you know, after we set the date for it in the last year, I just got to work. You know, I got in the studio, uh, started creating. I wanted a whole new body of work for the show. I wanted something that people had not seen before, uh, that I hadn't seen before, I hadn't done before. And I was lucky enough also to get some temporary studio space in a large warehouse to be able to do a massive piece. The biggest piece in the show is 16 and a half feet by four and a half feet. I love working at scale. And so the whole show has come together, you know, as a body of work, uh, big pieces, you know, normal sized pieces, uh, and very happy with how it came out and, and looking forward to the next one already. So it's pretty simple. The, uh, you know, the Fountainhead brings through 33 new artists from around the world every year. And uh, if you're in Miami, once a month they have an open house and anyone can attend. And uh, you gotta meet the artists, see their work, potentially buy the work. And then you meet a bunch of other interesting people that have similar passions and, and appreciate uh, you know, what the artists are doing, what the artists are bringing. Um, and from there, I've met a ton of great artists, and, you know, bought several of their works, stayed in touch with a good number of them. And every month there's a new crew uh, coming into town. So it's, it's exciting, it's fun, uh, it's refreshing, and it's also extremely educational because you know, meet people from Mongolia, Egypt, Colombia, South Africa, New York, LA, Chicago, Detroit, etc. And um, you know, they all have different perspectives and, and it's just a really, really good group. The latest trip to South Africa was fantastic. You know, it was my fourth time over there. Specifically, this trip was all centered around the arts, uh, specifically the Cape Town Art Fair that took place in February. So I went with a group from the Fountainhead Residency here in Miami, a bunch of other art patrons, donors, collectors. Um, and we had two weeks, uh, mostly in Cape Town, you know, and also in Joburg, where we did gallery visits, museum tours, went to collectors' homes, uh, visited artists in their studios, and really just had an amazing, amazing two weeks over there. The, the art scene in, in Africa, is, especially South Africa, is extremely vibrant, um, and made a lot of new friends over there. Looking forward to going back uh, at some point soon. Uh, brought like, six new works back to Miami uh, from you know, the various uh, you know, group of South African artists, uh, and really just had an amazing time with a bunch of amazing people. So CTAOP is the Charlize Theron Africa Outreach Project uh, that she started, I want to say about 17 years ago now. And uh, it's an organization that 
you know, right now the, the mission is really focused around youth health and education, uh, including leadership and, and, and youth empowerment. Um, and it's, it's a different model than a lot of other organizations and a lot of other you know, charities that, that go into you know, countries and, and try to make a difference. Um, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, what I found most interesting about the organization, one of the reasons that I got involved uh, initially as a supporter and now uh, as a member of their Ubuntu Council, uh, is they find people on the ground doing the actual good work in their communities, and we just want to know how to magnify their impact. You know, and so if somebody is you know, in Cape Town or is in Joburg or is in Durban or Port Elizabeth or somewhere else in South Africa, and they've got a project that helps youth with after school, you know, they help you know, women and children in a shelter environment, uh, they you know, help with HIV uh, prevention, education, that kind of thing. Uh, we want them to do more. So if they're having an impact and you can measure the impact, we want to make sure that that can be expanded not only in their community, but maybe also applied to other communities. So the Henley Dinners really emerged from a desire for more connection in the community face-to-face. -face. You know, the last few years have been kind of crazy around the world and, and um, you know, I've always preferred in-person connection and, and uh, you know, felt some of that was missing. And, and one day I, I looked at LinkedIn and I had thousands of people I was supposedly connected to. It was the first person connection. I realized I have a lot of them in Miami and I have a lot of them that I've never even met. And, not been in person so I said can I organize something to try to bring you know the offline connection or the online connections into offline connections uh, you know and, and create some kind of in-person community and you know when I started thinking about how to do that you know I initially just reached out to people on LinkedIn and invited them out for a coffee uh, that was met with mixed success uh, some people never got back to you and, and, and other people you know were up for it but I said well what if I you bring them even more value. Or I say, okay, instead of just having a coffee with me, what if I invite them to a dinner and they can meet eight or nine other you know, new people or interesting people that, that are in the community? Um, and so I started organizing these dinners. And, and the dinners also came from my general uh, you know, enjoyment of bringing people together. I've been doing that really my whole life through hosting parties or events. And um, yeah, I'm very lucky to run in various circles. And, you know, I like bringing people together who I like and I know um, with other people who they would never come across with, they, they would never come across in their daily life just because they, they operate in different places, in different circles. Um, and so when I started organizing the Henley Dinners, I just started with my own network. And I said, okay, I have friends in the arts, I have friends from jujitsu, I have friends from finance, I have friends from the humane society, I have friends from my neighborhood and the growth. Um, what if I pick, you know, one of each and organize a dinner around it, just had them meet each other. And so that's how the first dinners came together. Uh, it wasn't LinkedIn contacts or, or outreach on that. It just like, oh, let's start this organically and let's you know, take the network I already have on the ground and just um, you know, cross pollinate a little bit and, and make sure that these good people doing good things in different areas get to know other people and, and you know, see what goes from there. So I've had 12, been doing it for about a year and a half. They're roughly monthly. We take some time off, you know, in the summers around the holidays. Uh, but roughly once a month, we host the dinners, and every dinner has a different group of people. And one of my you know, rules, and there's not a lot of rules, but uh, once you come to the dinner, you can't come back for a year. Um, you know, people have so much fun at the dinners. A lot of times, they'll want to come back to the next one or, or, or another one and do them over and over again, which is great. And I'd love to have them back. Um, I also want to give people. Uh, Give the most people the opportunity to attend one and, and come to one and become part of the community. Yeah, so I host all the dinners at the Red Rooster in Overtown. Uh, when I started out the dinners, an idea I had was I'll move them. So every month we would do a different restaurant. Um, the first one we did at Red Rooster Overtown, and it was such a good experience. It just, it just felt like a good home base for the dinners. So we just, you know, have maintained it there. And the reason for the Red Rooster, the reason I like Red Rooster so much is because of its blend of fantastic food, um, great art, uh, great music, and, and just really friendly people. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a restaurant that's been in Miami now for a little over three years. And it's in a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of other restaurants around it. And so if, if you're a tourist and you stay on the beach, 
you're staying in the Grove, you're never gonna find Red Rooster, it's not walking distance, it's not you know, one of the 20 closest restaurants to, to where you are. So when I have friends come in from out of town, that's where I usually take them to the Red Rooster. It's one of my favorite restaurants in Miami. And they have this private room that is you know, basically uh, flush with art. Uh, really great art from you know, McLean Thomas, uh, Stefan Arblot, and several others in that room specifically. And uh, you know, it's a table for 10. And I found from organizing these dinners that 10 is the max capacity and really still a good number. Um, 11, the wheels start to fall off a little bit because you know it's, it's harder for everybody to participate, it's harder for everybody to hear. Um, and so you know, we keep the dinners between eight and 10 people just to maximize the experience for everybody involved. All right, there's a lot, so I'll narrow down the list for you a little bit and try to focus. Um, in the Grove, my favorite restaurant's area, they just have a really unique farm to table spread, good food across the board, whether you're getting you know, fish or meat or veggies. I always get the venison there. Uh, it's, it's my go-to place for venison in Miami. Um, for coffee, it's Imperial Moto Cafe, uh, which is up in the Little River area around 72nd, 73rd. Um, they have a motorcycle in the middle of the coffee shop. And it's just a really cool vibe, uh, good coffee, good people. Uh, on, the, on the lunch side, and even on the dinner side, uh, and out of a, you know, kind of, or under the radar place is Pinch Kitchen, uh, which is up on, you know, I guess, North Miami, uh, around 83rd and Biscayne, I believe. Uh, fantastic burger, everything on the menu is great. It's one of those you know, chef-owned, you know, one, you know, one solo shop, it's not a chain. It's, it's a really you know, good experience, good food. And then downtown, my favorite spot is Alloy Bistro, A-L-L-O-Y. It's off most people's radar because you don't see it from the streets. Tucked back in. Uh, this alley is a great outdoor courtyard, lights, great for a date, great for family events, you know, business lunches, you know, any other kind of dinner uh, that you want. Uh, Italian seafood spot. My favorite thing on the menu is the uh, duck prosciutto, which is just so, so good. But everything there is good and the people are, are, are friendly and, and it's, uh, it's a hidden gem within downtown. Miami. 